This is exercise 19 and it deals with the spinal cord as well as the spinal nerves. We look first uh, with the spinal cord and the layers that are surrounding to help protect them. These are the spinal meninges. They're the same layers as what we saw with the cranial meninges. So there's three layers, the dura mater, arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. They actually are continuous with the cranial meninges. And then also keep in mind you've got your cerebral spinal fluid that is filling that subarachnoid space. So in this diagram you can see uh, the three different layers. The pia mater is going to be attached directly to the spinal cord, just like the pia mater and the cranial meninges is attached directly to the brain. The outermost layer, more superficial layer, is the dura mater. And we have spaces between each of these layers. So going from the vertebral column, you have the epidural space that contains fat. Uh, then you would have the dura mater. Then you have the subdural space. Then beneath that would be the arachnoid mater. Then you have the subarachnoid space, that's where the cerebral spinal fluid is. And finally you would have the pia mater, and then below that is actually then the spinal cord. This is another uh, diagram of the spinal cord. Once again, the three meningeal layers are labeled, as you can see, the pia mater, arachnoid mater, spinal dura uh, mater, that the, the three layers. When you look at the spinal cord itself, notice a few different things. In the middle, the very center is what we call the central canal. The cerebral spinal fluid is also flowing here. You have the ventral median fissure and then the dorsal median sulcus, which almost uh, divide the spinal cord in half. It's not completely all the way through but it does make it easy to see a left and right side. The other thing to notice on here is the gray matter versus the white matter. The gray matter is often described as being in the shape of a butterfly with the central canal would be representing the body of the butterfly. And then you've got quote unquote the wings. With the gray matter, uh, this is located in the interior portion of the spinal cord with the white matter being more superficial. And if you remember from the brain, the brain, this is reverse. In the brain you have the gray matter along the cortex area and then inferior to that would be the white matter. So it's reversed in the spinal cord. With the gray matter we do divide the sections up into what we call horns. And as you can see, the names are by the location. So you have the dorsal horn, the ventral horn, and the lateral horn. That's true on each side. The gray commissure is the area where the gray uh, matter is passing by the central canal and connecting one side with the other. For the white matter, it can be called either columns or funiculus. You can use either term. And once again, the name is given by the location, dorsal, ventral, or lateral column, or funiculus. The spinal nerve is going to be the nerve that's part of the peripheral nervous system as it innervates the rest of the body. It is not part of the spinal cord. However, it is going to come in and attach to the spinal cord. If you notice on this diagram, you have the spinal nerve coming in. I think it's easy to see on this diagram how then it splits into the dorsal root ganglion. is that swelling area and proceeds to the dorsal root that then connects to the spinal cord. And then you also have the ventral root. So directly attached to the spinal cord itself will be your dorsal root and your ventral root, they will come together and merge to form that spinal uh, nerve. The pia mater, back to the spinal meninges, has a couple of features. The phylum termini down at the most inferior portion um, at the end of the spinal cord, and then throughout the spinal cord you have the 
denticulate ligaments, both of these features are helping to attach the pia mater to the spinal cord. If it's a, uh, a membrane, it can't be slipping and sliding all over the place. It has to be attached. So this is where, how it is physically attached to the spinal cord. And this is showing uh, representative drawings of both of these features in the attachment. The spinal cord begins at the form of magnum. That's how it uh, passes through the skull. And it's attached through the form of magnum uh, to the brain stem. The spinal cord will extend down to about the L1, L2 vertebrae. And where it ends, it kind of forms this cone-shaped structure. And that, that, that is referred to as the conus medulli aris. You do have nerve fibers that will extend uh, below this point, but the spinal cord itself ends between the L1 and L2, which is why if they do a spinal tap, they will usually go about the L3, so they do not hit the spinal cord. Within the uh, spinal cords, you have these spinal nerves that are connecting and then protruding out from the spinal cord. How do they get out of that vertebral foramen? They're going to be passing between each of the vertebrae, and we can um, number and name the spinal nerves. There are 31 pairs of them. They will be coming out each side of the vertebral foramen. There are eight cervical, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, five sacral, and one coccygeal spinal nerve. So this is showing, if you look along the diagram of the spinal cord, you can see where the uh, various spinal nerves will come protruding between each of the vertebrae. All of those spinal nerves are mixed nerves. That means that they contain both sensory and motor fibers. Um, as I said a bit ago, the spinal nerve is formed by that union of the dorsal root and the ventral root, as we see on this diagram here. So they merge together to form that spinal nerve. Now, the spinal nerve itself is mixed, but just so you are aware, the dorsal root is containing sensory and the ventral root is containing motor. But as they merge together to form the spinal nerve, it's a mixed nerve. This is also just for orientation purposes, showing the ventral median fissure and the dorsal median subflow. So as I said, the spinal cord itself will end between L1 and L2. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The lumbar sacral and coccygeal nerves tend to travel within the vertebral column to reach where um, they need to move between the vertebrae further down. And those uh, spinal nerves that are traveling in that vertebral column below the end of the spinal cord are referred to as the caudal equina. Why? Because all the strands together kind of looks like a horse's tail. In terms of the nerves, uh, a plexus is just a network of nerves. There's four spinal cord nerve plexus, the cervical plexus, brachial plexus, lumbar plexus, and sacral plexus. As you see, they are named by the region of which they're servicing. Uh, this would be the the cervical plexus, one of the main nerves here, they're all important, but one of the main ones that you'll often hear about is the phrenic nerve. That is innervating or supplying the diaphragm, which is going to be extremely important in helping with breathing. And then the brachial plexus, you can see, includes things such as the axillary nerve, the radial nerve, ulnar nerve, and median nerve. They're servicing the upper limb, the upper arm. The femoral nerve is innervating uh, the quadricep muscles of the thigh and then also the knee. The sciatic nerve is servicing the lower um, 
part of the leg. It, it can actually service all the leg, but especially the lower part of the leg. This is the longest and the thickest nerve that's in the body. From clinical um, aspects, when someone receives an epidural block, what they're doing is uh, the anesthesiologist will be injecting the, the medication into that epidural space. What it is going to do is block, so you do not have the sensation of, say, pain um, for the area. And we know exactly where to inject this, say, between which vertebrae, uh, so we know which area it's going to affect uh, for which nerves that you're wanting to block the, the pain sensation. Um, that epidural space is, is pretty narrow, so just hopefully the person's had a lot of training with it. Um, it there is some risk involved with it. Uh, for women who have had um, children, if you chose to have an epidural block, they would be injecting between the L3 and the L4. Sciatica is um, a condition that as a lot of people have, where the sciatic nerve is either injured or it's compressed, it's pinched, and so you're getting this uh, pain sensation. Because this is the longest nerve, you may feel pain all the way down your leg and even to your toes. Some people complain about numbing of their toes even. One thing that may help some individuals that they have found with who suffer from sciatica, a lot of people who do a lot of sitting, especially while driving, truck drivers, things like that, um, end up suffering from this. One thing that may give a little bit of relief is, and this may sound crazy, but especially for men. Men typically, where do they put their wallet? in their back pocket and then they're sitting down on it and that when you're sitting with something in your back pocket it gets you a little bit off tilt and that can cause some problems and sometimes they have found that if you just remove items from your back pocket before you sit down especially if you're going to be sitting for a long time like I say truckers you know cross-country drives um, that's a long time setting, especially if you're off tilt. So just take the wallet out, take the, your cell phone out, whatever it is that's in the back pocket, so that you're sitting basically level. And that, it, it may not solve it, but it may help a little bit.